So it's my great honor to introduce you to Becky Margiotta. Uh, by way of explanation, I, seven weeks ago today, I slipped on some ice in New York City and broke my ankle in three places, and, um, and, and uh, it was truly one of the best things that ever happened to me. I'm in no pain right now, but I'm one of those people that can't sit still for a second, and for the last seven weeks, I've been laying in bed with my foot up, and my three-year-old and my one-year-old kind of snuggled up on me, and, and uh, it's been actually wonderful, and so I'm not in any pain, but... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a logistical nightmare. People who have something like this all the time, I have a whole new level of empathy and respect for that. It is such a privilege for me to be here today, and I kind of want to do my Miss Pac-Man imitation. Do you guys want to hear that? Waka, 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 ding, 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 ding. Waka, 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 waka. Anyways, that's, like, that's, a, that's my fun thing. Um, <laughs> this is the stuff my partner's like, don't do that. So just, so um, I, I gave a keynote yesterday at Carnegie and then flew down here last night with Lindsay, Lindsay Hill and, and, uh, and I, I, I get bored of talk, hearing myself talk. Was anybody there at Carnegie yesterday though? One or two of you? Yeah. Um, good. So if this is a completely different keynote and I'm going to say things that I've never said in any group larger than four or five very close friends, some of which are uh, not suitable for work all the way. Um, and, uh, and Lindsay has agreed to be my barometer. And so if Lindsay's like, okay, okay, I think it's okay. But then she's also going to be like, if I start going too far. So lot, no pressure, no pressure, Lindsay. But I did see that like up that there's like big ass fans on the ceiling, and so I feel like I've, I'm with the right people. Um, and and uh, I, Mark, thank you for your very kind and generous introduction, and, and Ben and Laura, thank you for having me here. And I, when you said I was an educator, I almost teared up there a bit. I was like, well, I always wanted to be a teacher when I was a kid. And so, yeah, I feel teary now. <laughs> um, wow. Okay, so... Uh, I get emotional sometimes. I, I, I'll share with you. I sat at that, uh, the gym and, and almost sobbed seeing all of you and seeing this space. And I was crying, telling Ben, look what you created. Look what you have created. Isn't this incredible here? Do you not every one of you want your kids to go to school here? You know, I'm like texting my wife, like, we have to move. <laughs> you know, and like, uh, it's just absolutely wonderful. And I just, I want to take a moment and appreciate you for being here and being the kind of educator that, that wants to soak all this in. And so let's just take a moment and appreciate where we are and who we are and what you do every day because this is it, you know, this is it. This is, you are with your people. This is Mecca. This is the place. And, and amen for this, right? So thank you. Thank you for creating this. This is amazing. All right, God, I just like become so emotional as an old lady. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm gonna tell you a story and it's not suitable for work. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this is the riskiest thing I've ever done. And, and, um, and I hope you still like me when it's over but, and be soft on the person. Uh, but I, uh, and, um, and, um, and I really, but, but I, what I really believe that what you're doing and what is here is so precious and amazing and I hope that it's more likely to become a candle than the kindling. And I've, 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 I come from a whole different sector, but I've thought long and hard about what it takes to be more candle and less kindling. And, and I want to share with you what that might be, because the hope will be that you leave here deputies and disciples carrying the torch, and you're going to take that home with you where it might not be like this. 
And it might not be as friendly of an environment to adapt and try some of these things you learned. And there might be some like, yeah, but that, we, that's not how we do things here, right? Who know? I don't know how friendly, how, ex, how enthused and excited your colleagues are going to be when you return home, right? So absorb in as much as you can when you're with your people here. And I want to give you some stuff to start thinking about now about how you can just carry this with you and have this be a torch and have this be a candle and have there be much, much, much more of this in the world and, 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 and hurry up because my, my kids are three in one and, and this is what I want for them deeply, deeply. So in my stories, I guess I should get my slides, a slide or two up here. What I want to share with you um, is, is from the world of homelessness. And as Mark said, I, I worked on homelessness for 11 years, uh, coming out of the military, which uh, uh, knew nothing about it at all. And my job was to reduce street homelessness by two thirds in three years in Times Square of New York City, back in 2003, where at the time that was the highest density of street homelessness. And knowing nothing about it, um, and having not much money, we just got one small grant and I hired an, an AmeriCorps, who just amazing. And there were 13 other organizations that worked in this small area doing something to quote unquote help homeless people. And, and my thinking was, well, let me just go see, let me, let me go see what they're doing. And my job was to knit together what they were doing so it was out in housing. And I went out on street outreach with uh, the police department, with different faith groups, with different mental illness and substance abuse treatment and shelters and programs and all that. And largely what I saw was them being kind of rude and mean to the people on the streets um, or condescending. And almost every time I went out with them, they, they would walk past someone who had been on the streets seemingly forever. And, and I, with total beginner's mind, said, hey, wait, wait, you, what about that guy? You missed that guy. And they'd say, oh, he doesn't want it. He's been out here forever. That's what they'd say. And, I was like, and, and then they'd say, oh, he's service resistant. So do you guys have that kind of sense sometimes about some kids? Do some people think that about some kids? It's the kids, right? So that was the mental model that I was working with. And my, my job wasn't to hand out, I didn't get to count how many sandwiches I count, handed out or, or get people into something temporary. My job was to get the census down, to get outcomes. And so what we did was we realized you can't add that up and have it result in people being in housing. So we just started ourselves moving people in to apartments and going up to people on the streets and saying like, hey, my name's Becky, how you doing, what's up? And they say, go away. And we say like, hey, I was wondering if you wanted your own apartment. <laughs> kind of twirl our hair. And they'd say, uh, no. <laughs> and I'd be like, no, no, I mean like your apartment. And they'd be like, go away. And I'd be like, no, actually, no, really, your own apartment. Can I watch TV there? Yeah. Can I bring my girlfriend? Yeah. And they're like, okay, I want that. Because no one had ever talked to them about that before. And we had these conversations tons of times, and sure enough, people had been on the streets, the same people that those other people had walked by and said were service resistant, both wanted and were willing and able to move into housing and did so. Um, and, and by us focusing our efforts on getting those people that all the other teams had walked past into housing, we were actually able to see an 87% reduction in street homelessness in Times Square. <laughs> And in, in, in doing so, what we discovered was we had to turn everything on its head. We had to go for the people who'd been on the streets the longest, and those people happened to be at a very high risk for dying, and in fact, in many cases, before we could get them into housing, they did die. And we found out that there was a doctor in Boston who cared about this very much too, and he had done research and discovered eight conditions plus street homelessness equals a death rate like cancer. And so we built into our standard operating procedures, into our protocols, every, we would go methodically on the streets for, from seven, five to seven a.m. every day, find everyone who was out there, get their name, get their picture, ask them if they had any of these eight health conditions. And I'm talking like literally like, hey, what's your name? How long have you been out here? Do you have HIV AIDS? And at the time, people thought, you can't ask that. That's too personal. And people, I have had at least 40 people to me just be like, oh yeah, yes, you know, right? So very personal questions. Um, get their picture so we could go back and find them and say, this is who we're gonna house. And we housed in that order. We specifically proactively said, longest and the most highest risk of dying, you go in first. And we use that for our own operations and we called it the vulnerability index and we just kind of made it up. Other cities started hearing 
about, actually, let me show you one, one other story. So the last guy in Times Square was this dude, Heavy, and everybody knew about Heavy and wanted to, he, he was just, he, he was quite the character. The New York Times wrote a, a, a piece about him and said there's only one homeless person left in Times Square and it's Heavy. And, and a little story about what, what his existence was like. And, and my team tried for years and years, every single day going to see if he would accept housing and he said no. So at some point your only resort is to someday they might be a harm to self or others so you can remove them against their will. Um, and he, that did happen eventually and took him to the hospital and then this was heavy, right? So, and heavy, when he kind of came to and the psych meds cleared out, he said like, why'd y'all leave me out there so long, <laughs> right? And so that's like, so I got over four years, just deep, deep, deep confidence. There's no person who cannot be housed, right? And I know that you have that in your bones about your kids too, right? There's no kid who can't do these things, right? And so that there's, and, and I got challenged on that a lot, but I knew, right? And I like, I, and so, so this, this changed me. It changed what I thought was possible. And other cities started, saying, we want to do what you did there. And I imagine that's happening at High Tech High and in your schools of like, we want to, we want to do what you're doing. And I, my thinking at the time was, you have to do this very complicated, you, you know, there's swimsuit and evening gown and talent. You know what I mean? Like, wait, there's all these things you have to do to be able to do it like we did it. And they said like, no, 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 we just, we just want the vulnerability index survey. <laughs> I was like, no, but you need everything. And they're like, just give us the survey, you know? Oh, they wanted me to come teach them how to do it. And the first place I went outside of Times Square was to Skid Row in Los Angeles. Have any of you ever been out on Skid Row? So you know, right? So it's like this, right? Like this is what it looks like at 4 a.m. And we switched it to going out at 4 a.m. So in 2007, winter of 2007, with about 20 county employees in LA, we went out on the streets of Skid Row from 4 to 6 a.m. for nine mornings in a row and surveyed every person sleeping outside. Now, the, the powers that be, all the people who, the homeless advocates, you know, in air quotes, said, one, they won't talk to you. Two, if they do talk to you, they won't tell you the truth. Three, if they tell you the truth, they won't want housing. Four, if you give them housing, they're gonna mess it up, right? This is gonna bomb. And, and uh, I said, well, watch, you know, I, I knew from Times Square, okay, well, I don't, can't imagine your homeless people are that different from our homeless people, but you know, let's see what happens. Sure enough, they, they found the 50 most vulnerable people on Skid Row and housed them in a matter of weeks. And, and, uh, and actually faster than we had housed them in New York City. And, and through doing, they just sit out on the streets and administer these surveys. And it was just really, it's, it, I, was, I was amazed. And when, when we were done in, in, in Skid Row, Santa Monica was there. And Santa Monica, we, we briefed them, here's who's gonna die if you don't do something, and somehow that seemed to have a catalytic effect. Santa Monica pulled me aside and said, um, Becky, please come do this in Santa Monica. And by this point, I was like, just take a survey, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, here, you can have it, you know? And we had developed where you can enter it online and it scores you for you and all this stuff, you know? And they were like, no, no, we really want you to come. And I was like, I lived in New York City, and I was like, it is February, I guess I should. And so, so I was like, okay, I'll come to Santa Monica too. And that's gonna, that's gonna be part of the story here in a minute, but um, it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And this is actually, more and more cities wanted to do it, more and more cities wanted to do it. This is San Diego, and people started including volunteers. So this is actually Robin Monroe from the Business Improvement District in San Diego. Your congresswoman, somebody Davis, she was out surveying, you know, your, your county supervisors were out there surveying, and it became a thing. And San Diego housed hundreds of people um, uh, off of, out of their central business district, right? And so this just, it just caught on like wildfire and everyone wanted to do this thing. And um, I got, eventually got called by a really small town and, and that wanted me to come. And I was like, you could just house everybody, don't bring me. And, and had this thought of like, what if we proactively were actually really trying to house a lot of people? So at the point where we had been in about 20 cities, I thought, um, well, what if we could do something really huge? And my, my friend and now business partner, I learned about his work where the 100,000 Lives campaign, where essentially hospitals accidentally kill people, unfortunately, um, and they launched a campaign in 18 months to get 4,000 hospitals to do six things differently, and in doing so, not accidentally kill 100,000 people. And, and I, as soon as I heard about that, I wrote in my margin, I was like, we should do that, and like scooted it over to my boss, and we, we hired, now my business partner, Joe, to be my coach and mentor and teach me how to do large-scale change. So it went from 
doing my Times Square to spending two years going from city to city and really seeing how it adapts from city to city to proactively saying, hey, what if together we could house 100,000 people? Uh, that started in 2010. And, and over the course of the next four years, what we saw was communities joining the campaign and getting excited about this. We built as close as we could to a movement. And, and in the course of doing so, we realized not only do we have to get people excited about this and doing their registry week, but we also had to help them improve the rate at which they were housing people. So the, the, the enthusiasm was kind of the kindling and it got it going, but then we needed more something like a campfire where they were on a consistent basis housing people much more quickly than they had previously done. And that created a lot of systems changes in the course of doing that. That pressure created some systems changes. And this is like the type of systems they were working in. So um, just imagine like me personally, just going to the DMV makes my eyebrows hurt, right? So we're asking the most, most disabled people in our communities with the least resources, and every little green magnet on here is a step you could possibly ask someone do to get from the streets into housing. And every orange, yellow thing is, is a period of days to weeks to months of waiting. And every red line is the chutes and ladders for poor people, right? Where you just go back to where you started. So it's not really surprising when you see this that we have street homelessness, right? Like if, 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 the, if you had to navigate this, you probably wouldn't be able to either. One missed appointment and you got to start over, right? And so we worked with people doing quality improvement and process improvement to create better systems on behalf of, of people on their streets. And four years, we originally said three years, we took an extra year, but four years, the 100,000th person moved in and, and we got to stand on stage with everybody else who had created this and, and, and announced this. And, and it was just what we like to say was, uh, the, the campaign is ending, but the movement is, continues, right? It was just, it was a win. It was a big win for the sector that, at that point, 186 cities had, had, had really drunk the Kool-Aid and transformed what they did. And, and now continue, and now many, many of them are, are rigorously pursuing getting to zero homelessness as the next play. And, and it really has created this deep, deep, rich roots of community of people throughout the country who are working really hard on this. And so the reason I share that story with you is I, I want you to, I want to kind of a little bit, if you're willing, for me to be a little bit of a ghost of Christmas future for you and say this is possible for you too with, with deeper learning and with what it is that you want to spread. And I know that right now, I think if, if Ben has told me that there's on, in any given year, like for example, about um, a million public presentations of learning take place. This is huge, this is huge, right? But there's still so many more kids who could benefit from this, right? And so we, the Billions Institute, we think of that as justice, right? Like getting, getting what works to everyone who could possibly benefit as fast as possible. So I'd love to share with you four ways that you can create this, what we call unleashing. And we define unleashing um, as, as really orchestrating the loss of control of thousands of people moving in the right direction, <laughs> right? So mostly what I'm gonna tell you are stories of kind of losing control and things that didn't quite go as planned but kind of worked out and how you can take that and really take advantage of that and use that as you take, as you take this home with you. Let's see. Yeah, so look, the first thing I wanna tell you about actually, I don't have a picture of this, is um, so when I went to, to Santa Monica with Julie Rusk, and you, you're gonna, I think you might see this when you get home. Um, do you guys ever work in situations where it's not actually really 100% sure who's in charge or like who gets to make the decisions? Okay, all right, so, okay. So this is gonna be the right story for you. This is where it gets edgy. I'm just watching Lindsay here, okay, okay. So, so, so here, we, there I was in Santa Monica, and you know we're doing our registry week, and this is only the second one we've ever done. And there's a woman named Julie who worked for the city. She's in the city manager's office, and it was clear to everybody else, kind of, that Julie was in charge. But there's also just tons of stakeholders, and and there's the business district, and the nonprofits, and the city, and it's just it's very complicated. And the way our government puts out the money, there's actually no one person in charge on homelessness. They all have to work together for something to work, right? And so. It just became clear to me by about Thursday that nothing was gonna happen unless Julie took charge. Like someone needed to take charge and it needed to be Julie. So one of the things that kind of evolved in registry weeks was after we got up from four to six in the morning, Thursday, three mornings in a row, Thursday night, we would go out and have a drink. And um, Thursday night, 
uh, I was talking with my, my colleague, and I said, I think we need to have the talk with Julie. And she said, I, I, I think we need to have the talk with Julie, too. And I was like, the chicken talk? And she was like, yeah, the chicken talk. And we knew what that meant. Julie did not know what that meant. So, so I pulled Julie aside, and I was like, Julie, <clears throat> there's something that we used to say in the military that I feel like I need to share with you. And she's like, okay. And I said, so let's just suppose you're, you know, you're, you're, we're, we're in, we're in, a, we're in, a, we're driving in our vehicle in the military, and we pull a, pull a, pull upon another vehicle in a convoy, and there's a flat tire, and all the soldiers are sitting there smoking and joking. That's what we used to say, just hanging out, not doing their thing, not, and nobody's taking charge. So what the the appropriate thing to say in that situation, if you're the more senior person and you want to find out who's in charge, is to and this is where I just, you know, cover your ears if this is going to be offensive, um, is to go up to, go up to the group of people where it's clear no one's taking charge, and you say, who's effing this chicken here right now, <laughs> right? And because somebody's got to eff the chicken, right? I don't, I just learned this in my young 20s. Oh, was that the video? <laughs> oh, okay, the chicken's going to work. So that was great effect. Right, and so, um, and, and, and literally in the military, when you'd say that, someone would be like, all right, I got it. You know what I mean? Like, like the person who was in charge would step up, right? And like, like it would, they would get kind of called out on not taking charge when you should take charge, right? So I tell Julie this story, and Julie was like, yeah, someone needs to F the chicken, you know? And I'm like, I'm like Julie, it's you. <laughs> yeah, and she goes, I just saw her like kind of puff up, and she was like, I'm supposed to F the chicken? And I was like, you're supposed to F the chicken, Julie. And she's like, I'm supposed to F the chicken. And like, she was transformed in front of my very eyes, right? And her staff was like, oh, finally, right? Like, okay, thank you, please, someone take charge, right? And so I guess what I wanna say to you is like, that's true for you too, right? Like, there's nobody waiting to give you permission to take charge of this stuff. Is it still okay, Lindsay? Are we still okay? Okay, all right, okay. So, so, so th this, this is the way things, this is the way things happen is someone just jumps in and just says, I'm, by goodness, I'm going to do it, right? And when that happens, it's just so much more, it's just, it's going to last so much longer if you're in touch deeply with why it is that you do this work, right? Like if you're really able to connect in deep with why you do this work. And I know we're going to be talking about that later. And I know I'm going to scoot forward on time a little bit because I'm like telling these, I'm going to skip a few. But here, let me just tell you, as I started just going around from city to city, I started getting emails like this, and this is what I, I want you to see this. I started, I saved them all actually, and, and I want you to get emails like this. I want you to get emails, like, and I mean, I'm, I'm, this is from Bonnie in Los Angeles. I'm sure you know that as a social worker therapist, you can become distant and kind of hardened to the stories of the individuals we serve. Some becoming, um, since becoming involved with your program, I have found a renewed love and compassion for the clients we serve. I have found a new joy in the work I am doing and go home every night and talk to my family about the love I have again for my work. It's as if I were a therapist for the first time again after 20 years of working with the homeless mentally ill. I am so grateful for a chance to be of service in this program, right? That's what we're looking for, right? So we... we to the extent that the things you can take here are things that connect with you and why you became a teacher in the first place, and that's gonna be a thousand different answers for a thousand different people, but hold on to those like those are pure gold, right? And then you're looking, as you take those home with you, you're looking for the things that bring that out in other people. You want other people to tell you, this is why I became a teacher. This is why I became a principal, right? So you're for the very beginning of, I think from kindling to campfire, that's, that's the transition from kindling to campfire, right? Is this is why I became a teacher, right? And that sense of beginning growing sense of like, oh gosh, I can, I can do something. That sense of agency that we saw in Julie that day that just really, really caught on. So I wanna share that. I'm gonna skip a couple things, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but, um, I get, no, I'm just going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. Y'all are going to get plenty on equity while you're here. What I want to say, what I want to say is, um, when I first started doing this work, my, my think, in homelessness, my thinking was those people should get a job. And then I started noticing, uh, as I was housing people, oh, wow, um, this is like disproportionately black men. What's going on here? 
You know, and my staff, staff would say, have anybody else noticed like when we just like that this is happening? And, and we, we, we began to even make, do our own sense making of like, gosh, I, this seems kind of racist that this is happening disproportionately to a certain group of people. And as we peeled that onion more and more, I, I became just incredibly aware of the, the systems and structure and history that was creating homelessness in the first place was deeply racist. And, and that, 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 that what we were doing day in, day out was ultimately un correcting that as fast as we could, right? Um, and, but yet still, so many of those structures persisted, right? And so I wanna encourage you, I know the same is true in education too, that, that the education system we have reliably produces different outcomes for children of color, right? And so, so there's, there's, I just want, your work will be so much more powerful as it connects with why you became a teacher in the first place, and as it goes deeper, deeper down into really what's happening here. Like what mental models are we up against? Like do we actually really believe that, that every student can learn, that every person can be housed, or do we have some of our own biases that we need to check and, 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 and up, uproot and, and look at um, in the light of day and, and, and open our hearts even more to how, can we, how we can create really deep, deep change in the world. So I didn't know going into it how deeply racist what, what I was going up against was. Um, and it's not a coincidence that those people are left to die on the streets, right? But we can do something about that and I know we can do something about that in education too. Um, but I just, I skipped some of the other parts of that. That part I don't wanna skip. And I just want to encourage you to really think about what's going on in your school. If your school has different outcomes for different kids, you know, warning, 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 right? Like something, how can, how can what you learn here be part of helping to address that? So we're looking at, we're tapping into why we did this in the first place. We're facing into the, as deeply as we possibly can and working as much as possible at the roots of systemic change whenever we can and um, you may have this happen when you go home too, and I want to share it, is um, credit and recognition. So do you all ever have people where there's competition for whose idea it was or recognition? Do you have that in your sector at all? Does it matter whose idea something was? Or like, is there this thing like where like, oh, don't do that, you're gonna make us look bad? Do you guys have that? What do you guys have? What do you have? All of that, okay, okay. So. <laughs> So the, one of the worst mistakes that I made um, as the director of the 100,000 Homes campaign was CBS Evening News was gonna come do their nightly new ca newscast and, and, and cover our, our campaign. At the time, maybe 20, 30,000 people were in housing and this was cool. And um, we were very excited about this. And you can see here, like, I was like, oh yeah, I'm on the news. And um, they completely got the story wrong. And the people who were actually housing people, uh, which was um, St. Joseph Center in Venice, um, were not mentioned at all. And it made it look as though me and my team were personally housing 100,000 people. And, and we didn't know that, I mean, we were very clear that that was not the case, but CBS was just like, ah, tomato, tomato, you know? And, and, went on, and, and, and it blew up so bad in our face. And, um, because we really, honestly, I think unconsciously at least, wanted recognition and credit for what we were doing. And, and from that point on, it was such a game changer for us because literally one of our best teams that we worked with was under huge pressure from their board to withdraw from the campaign because their board felt kind of tricked or something. You know, It was certainly not intentional on our part, but I can see how they saw it that way. So we decided we we're gonna become the credit givers, that we we're gonna become the people who give credit and recognition, and that changed everything. Right? So you, when you go home, you wanna be the people who recognize and give credit and appreciation to people who are trying things that you bring with you, right? To find ways for other people to shine, to find ways to make other people like look really good. As much as you wanna, might wanna on the inside be like, jazz hands, it's me, you know? <laughs> um, right? Like the, the, the real, this is so much better to, to give than receive actually. Like that becomes, that can become, I think, that transition, begin to be that transition from campfire to candle. 
And I, 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 we, we did something where we created a, a club where everybody who was housing, every community that housed at a specific rate got a button. And, and it's, it's, it's just unthinkable to me how compelling that button was. So it doesn't have to be fancy or anything like that, but like something where people who do something really good get recognized. And we had a, like a junior staffer at the White House. And so we said, we're going to publish the two and a half percent list every week, every month, and we're going to send it to the White House. <laughs> and it went to a junior staffer at the White House. <laughs> But people wanted to get on this thing, right? Like it was just really, and we were able to, at our conference like this, come up and recognize the communities were doing that and they got standing ovations. Like it's really, it's not about us, right? It's about the kids, it's about our colleagues, about creating this whole new way of doing teaching. All right, so the last thing I want to share with you now, this moves into like, I've never ever, I think I've only shown this. The only people who have seen this are the chicken effers. And, <laughs> I'm really like, you know, I don't have a boss, but if I did, I would be really worried. <laughs> okay, but uh, I might not get invited back again. So we were about to finish the campaign and we we're about maybe 90,000 people in housing and we thought it was a fairly foregone conclusion, but we didn't want to just kind of like dribble drabble over the finish line. Like we wanted to finish strong, right? And so we had a little team meeting of like, what can we do to finish strong? And we thought, you know what? There've just been some people who've really emerged as real chicken efforts through this, you know? And by the way, somehow this thing caught on. Like, I don't even know how it happened, but literally my boss, who is this like most prim, proper Connecticut woman, like we were just trying like heck to get the VA to get on board with this thing. And she finally found real, someone really senior at the VA to help out. And I, I literally got an email from her that was like, forwarded that email from the VA and said, I guess we found our chicken effort. And I was like, <laughs> What happened? Like, like, this is talk about unleashing. I was like, you guys, like, whoa, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. You know, like, I had like the most proper, proper person. Like, and people are just like, it just sort of a little bit to my quasi horror caught on. But we figured go with it, right? It's still okay, Lindsay. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, so, so we thought, let's go, let's let the original, let's let the real people who've really done this know how much we appreciate and care and that we see them. And, and, and let's, we'll, that's gonna create this, this wind in our sails to finish strong. And um, we thought, well, how could we do that? And then this is literally a staff meeting. Well, I mean, we can't really, let's make a chicken effort award. And we're like, well, that's just really inappropriate. <laughs> well, well, what, you know, in the animal kingdom, is there anything that does F chickens? And someone was like, a rooster. <laughs> and so we made a rooster award. We made a rooster award. <laughs> And our, our logistics guy, our logistics guy were like, someone find a rooster for under five bucks, right? And so we went and I, I, it must have been from Cracker Barrel, God bless him. Like, it's like this like foot and a half long plastic metal rooster. It's so dumb and ugly looking. And um, he, he's like, I found some roosters on Amazon. We're like, I ordered a hundred, like, all right. And so we made, I made a video. Uh, that was so so a hundred people who were our roosters received in the mail they received this this rooster and um, and a little slip of paper with a YouTube link with a YouTube link and I'll tell you this is some of the conversations we had was it, it, that's all they received was the YouTube link and we never ever talked about it and um, we sent this to a, a deputy secretary at HUD who was a devout Mormon and and we were, and we were like, uh, you know, and someone was like, well, he is a chicken effer. And it's like, he is, you know, he is, he deserves this, you know? And, and then this other guy who like, you know, we all became Facebook friends. This other guy, like literally every other post was how like Jesus is his Lord and savior and stuff. And I was like, oh, I don't know, you know, and like, but he is a chicken, you know, he, and, and the, I got to tell you, like, I've, I've been a little shocked by how much people took, the pride people took in this, but I want you to see the video that, that our, our roosters got, right? So imagine you get this horrible thing, right? Uh, in the mail and, and, uh, and then you, you, you turn on the YouTube and this is what you see. So I just, this fanning the flames of identity. Do I have to go to the next slide? I think I might have to, yeah. I made, I made this at home, by the way. If I had gone to high tech high, it would be much better. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just apologize. You have to see this. Hey, 
you're probably wondering why you got this mysterious card in the mail with the link to this video. I'm the director of the 100,000 Homes campaign, and me and my team have decided that you... <laughs> we planned this. <laughs> it's like the big bleep, the big bloop. This is so inappropriate. <laughs> this is so... <laughs> While, she, while, while he's fixing that, I'll share that uh, identity is, that's the candle. Once you get to where people think of themselves, I am a deeper learning teacher, I am a whatever it is, and please don't use rooster, <laughs> that's when you've got the candle, right? And you can't stop that. That's an unstoppable force, right? And that doesn't just happen overnight. In fact, we didn't just manufacture that and it just happened, right? That that we were following people's lead at that point and just fanning the flames of that, right? But as you progress and continue to grow as, as a movement, um, identi an identity will begin to emerge and crystallize. And, and that being a badge of, of honor and pride and I am this kind of teacher, I am this kind of principal, that's, that, that will be what keeps this being a candle and, 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 and endures. And if you can have fun and unleashing people and having that happen, that's when you're really winning. Do you think, uh, do you think we'll be able to show this monstrosity? Okay, okay. Uh, I could, and, and, and um, yeah. I know, it, it has 667 views, and I'm like, okay, this is good. This is, because it was unlisted, it's, un, it's, it's private, we didn't want it to be found. Uh, I didn't want my parents to see it. <laughs> yeah. It's, I hope it's good. I hope it's, uh, you're like, uh. Oh, here we go. This has been this has been quite dramatic. This has been. <laughs> you guys have no idea how I'm, how relieved I am that like I didn't trip or or fall. This is just uh, I'm just so thrilled to be here. All right, should I uh, should I forward it or you got it? Amazing. Oh, if you do the five, four, three, two, one before a video, supposedly more people will watch it. People will actually watch, so that's kind of cool. You can hear it, but uh, barely. You and your team are worthy of our super secret chicken fucker award. You're probably wondering. Why would you use such a foul word to describe the war? <laughs> Actually, according to the Urban Dictionary, chicken fucker is a term that comes from the military. What it means is someone who's not necessarily technically in charge, but they're the one who gets things done. And that's exactly what you are. Your leadership has made this grassroots effort to house 100,000 people really take off. And in my personal opinion, it's one of the best things this country has going for right now. So on behalf of the 100,000 Homes Campaign team, I salute you. I appreciate everything you do to reduce suffering in the world and everything you do to make the world a better place. Seriously, you rock. Oh, and one other thing. This is a completely secret award. We're not going to put it on Facebook. We're not going to tell anybody that we've given it to you. And if anybody ever asks us about it, we're going to completely deny it. <laughs> we and you, we think that's more enough. Okay, now what I want you to do is eat the paper I guess you'd like to get that in the mail, right? Yeah. I, I had I had people call me and say, my wife is so upset that this is still in our living room. And, <laughs> and, and I'm like, sorry, man, sorry. 
Uh, can I show one, two more pictures? Is that possible? Yeah. So then pe this shit started showing up on Twitter, right? Like people be like, I can't say anything, but hey. <laughs> And then, then as it was getting close to the 100,000th person being housed, all of a sudden people started changing their Facebook profile pictures to roosters and like all different kinds of roosters. I, I no, none of my team took a screenshot of that, but literally my whole feed was roosters. And, and then there's this team in, in Whittier that, 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 that they made the rooster their mascot and they got like, they got little rooster things. Like it just, like once this happens, like literally like once a month, I'll get someone like, hey, we decided to do this with the rooster. And I'm like, oh God, you know, this is amazing. Right? And so that's, that's that, the candle, right? And so please use something less foul than I did. I apologize to everybody and your parents. Um, but, but if you can get there, right? So just if, you, if I can share anything, right? Tap into why are you doing this in the first place and do whatever it takes to get those emails from people that say, this is why I became a teacher. Go as deep as you can into the deepest leverage points for deep systemic equity change that you can get. We're all up working within a very racist system in the education system and anything we can do to, to dislodge and undo that is, 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 is work worth doing. And, and use recognition credit is better to give than to receive. Find ways of amplifying and highlighting and high-fiving others. It's so much more fun actually. And you know, fan those flames of identity. Whatever emerges, whatever it is that it's going to be, have fun with that. Have fun with that, and let that be the kind of the kind of educator that you are. And and with that, I'll just say it's been a real, real pleasure for you to be here. Thank you for having me. I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.